Well, good evening. We're back. Hi, it's everybody. Hi. 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 It's time for Tammany Hall and the story of corruption in America. Part two. Part two. There was enough corruption to fill two programs. <laughs> All right. Oh, I'm uh, Dr. Misha Griffith. She's a doctor. Hey, my, my and, shoulder hurts. Can you look yeah, at that? Ha, gee, no. She's a historian. Or, and and this is Jerry Griffith. Also known uh, as the hired help. Uh, the award-winning filmmaker. All right. Whatever. Don't let him fool you. <laughs> and this is a tiger, the emblem of Tammany Hall. And this is an elephant, the emblem, of course, the GOP. The Republican Party, which, despite how you may feel about them today, they were kind of the good guys for much of our story. Not entirely, but they entirely. Uh, did kind of kick the tiger. Yep. Okay, so, Misha, Dr. Griffith, what are we going to start with? Well, we first want to start... Uh, with discussing what a political machine is. Uh, it's where you uh, run your politicians through and uh, nope. something else comes out? Nope, that would be nice, but it isn't. It is, it is basically the, the party manufacturer or a political group. This That's, is the definition, actually, straight from Wikipedia. I stole it because I thought it was pretty good. A political group in which an authoritative boss or a small group commands the support of a core of supporters and businesses, often campaign workers, who receive rewards for their efforts based on the machine. The machine's power is based on the ability of the boss or the group for their candidates on election day. I think there's you're missing a word there. Yeah, probably, yeah. A little yeah. bit of typo. But and this is a political cartoon from the 1890s. Of basically, you can see it's got Tammany image. You've got respectable businessmen coming in and coming out in plaid suits. So not only does a political machine destroy the integrity of the political process, it also ruins your fashion sense. Because back in the 19th century, it wasn't necessarily uh, what we think of with uh, political action committees and the whole amount of money that we see now going into elections and swaying the elections back in the 19th century, it was actually getting the, getting the boots to the polls. Now for the record, and really I, I think I mentioned this elections. briefly last yeah. week, as I said, this is part two, but in some ways the system of corruption back then was more fair than what we had today because you more have fair. Yeah. Yes. Corruption, more fair. Okay. Yes. Corruption was more fair. Okay. If I lived in New York right. in the Fifth Ward in the 1880s, right. I have a ward healer who knows me, he comes mm -hmm. around, he sees my needs, he says, what do you want from the government? Right. I, I need this pothole filled up. I need this pothole filled up. I need more, we need more jobs. We need help in our neighborhood. Today, you live in a district which has been extremely gerrymandered, yep. and a Democrat winning this congressional district is about as likely as Tammany Hall coming back into power. Right. It doesn't happen. So in some ways, you had somebody listening to you under the mm -hmm. corrupt system that you don't today. We have replaced this corrupt ward healer political machine with gerrymandering, which in many ways, I think, can be seen as less fair. Maybe. there, there's. <laughs> but, it is, but it is a reflection of corporate money. And corporate money has been, since the Civil War, uh, a really important factor in American politics. Even back in the 19th century, I know I talked about, yeah, we don't have, we didn't have political action committees back then, but corporations did in fact uh, want their, want politicians working in their favor. Uh, and so- Corporations wanted them. And this is one of the issues, which what was called by the reformers. And again, this is a bit of review. The reformers called it Corruption, but in many ways, instead of listening to corporations and business interests, these politicians were listening to people on the street. Right. But there was still corruption. There were still people paying for offices, but there were corporations paying for offices. Imagine if you had, let's say, somebody who was an executive at a defense contractor mm -hmm. who manipulated his way into becoming secretary of defense or even right. vice president. You know, that would never happen today. Okay. Um, but essentially, this is part of the thing. Even then, you had people, and we're going to mm -hmm. talk about some of them, who were playing the game mm -hmm. for their political ends. You know, And it also depends on how you define corruption. Could you just pause that, please? Yeah. Are you talking about corruption in, uh, in the idea of getting people out to vote and voting a certain way? Or are you talking about getting people into offices, especially elected offices, where they make a huge amount of money. We're going to talk about both sides of that well, corruption issue. What if issue. you're getting them into offices just working like, let's say, policemen? Let's say you make all your mm -hmm. friends policemen, and the policemen find that they can shake down other people for a lot of money. Yep. All yeah. right. 
So, so corruption is not just one little, one little set of rules. Now, we left off last week. We were talking a little bit about the credit mobilier scandal, which right. sort of enveloped the Republican Party, right. which is people that were on the take with the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. The building of the Transcontinental Railroad. The, the funding for that was very difficult, especially uh, with the idea that the, the nation had just gone through a civil war. Uh, I realized the building had started during the Civil War uh, and been going on during the course of the Civil War. But after the Civil War, they were still having difficulties building it. Okay. So I wanted to start, unless you've got something else first, mm -hmm. with this is the Republican Convention of 18, sorry, the Democratic Convention of 1868. Mm -hmm. The Democrats decided to hold their convention in New York City in Tammany Hall. This is Tammany Hall decorated. This is the interior of it. It's really, you know, quite an elaborate building. You can see there's a sign there that says Tammany up at the front. It was just a beautiful, intense job. The Democratic Convention met in New York. Uh, mm -hmm. the, they met in like September. Now, way back in Way back in January, the Republicans had their convention, right. and they nominated Ulysses Grant. Ulysses S. Grant. Now, in my opinion, Ulysses Grant was the war hero. He had unified the nation. He brought everything together. Probably unstoppable. <laughs> right, yeah. The, the force of being a veteran of the Civil War for the North, for the Republicans, was crucial to holding office. In fact, when you read the reports of the people serving in Congress, serving in Senate, serving on committees. It's general this and general that and general this. and ge It's kind of like that joke that we make about the Southerners and their colonels and everyone was a colonel in the, in the Southern cavalry. Well, after the Civil War, it was the generals. Republicans and their generals. And they all adopted these huge beards. Supposedly, the style was to reflect how it was difficult to shave when you were in camp. And so everyone grew their beards. It's like wearing out. jeans everywhere. Or so, like so, manly. so these are people who had fought the Civil War ages ago, but were still wearing these, these incredibly big beards. Basically, you could take all of the pictures of the um, of the presidents and the presidential candidates between 1868 and 1900, and replace them with the guys on the Ludens cough drops. I think it's the Smith brothers. Smith brothers. Well, the Ludens Whatever. cough drops. The, the yeah. cough, tr the cough yeah, drop you, guys. You know what we're All talking right. about. Okay. Yeah. So the Democratic convention meets in the summer or in September in New York in right. Tammany Hall. Now they have a problem. Somebody's got to face Ulysses Grant. Right. Who is going to do it? How do we differentiate ourselves from this war hero who brought the nation together? Okay. The first choice, the first guy who saw it was the incumbent president. Andrew Johnson was a Democrat. Yes. People forget that. Lincoln was a Republican. He had a Democratic vice president. Mm -hmm. Andrew Johnson was a vice president. People said, ah, excuse me, didn't we just impeach you? Yeah. <laughs> he was I not a popular guy. Don't think you're going to be our first choice. Yeah. Now, they ultimately, they selected a gentleman named Horatio Seymour who went down in flaming defeat. But what's scary and determining about this and helped set the future of Tammany Hall was at the convention, they had a speaker, this guy on the left-hand side of your screen, um, kind of a handsome man until you know that he was ugly through and through. That is General Nathan Bedford, Bedford Forrest. Forrest. Yes. There's on the... Uh, Far right of your screen, you can see that's an ad from before Forest and Maples slave dealers. Yeah, he was uh, he was the guy who insp who uh, Forrest Gump was named after. Yes, he did not actually start the Klan, but he was the first Grand Wizard. He was a very powerful leader of the Klan. He went to Tammany Hall in New York City, and he basically said, "If you want any support from Southern states, you are going to oppose Reconstruction. You are going to end this." Occupation, the Reconstruction, right. which is putting black people in positions of power, mm -hmm. which is weakening the white hegemony. If you want any support, you're the Democratic Party. You're going to do that. And that is what led to the choosing of the ribbon you see in the center. Our motto, this is a white man's country. Okay? Yes. Now, you, you can imagine that we talked last week about the draft riots that the Irish in New York, the Irish immigrants in New York held draft riots because they felt that they were being treated unfairly. And of course, the opposite, the, the Republicans threw the charge at them that they were disloyal, that they 
uh, were not uh, good Americans. Well, you can imagine in 68, you've got the victorious general, Ulysses S. Grant, up against Nathan Bedford Forrest, who is being uh, uh, pushed by Tammany Hall. So Tammany Hall, again, is looking like they are completely supporting the, the cause of secession. And 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 also uh, slavery, racial intolerance, and racial well, not, intolerance. Well, slavery is over, but still, yeah. they're pushing racial intolerance. And for the record, I'm kind of glad that Grant won, even though yeah. Grant had nasty scandals and political corruption in his administration, which we're going to talk about a bit right now, because right. General Grant became President. Grant was a very skilled general, mm -hmm. very great leader, but he um, he wasn't so good of a political administrator. Um, this is General Grant, and beside him is, I believe he was... Speaker of the House. James, James G. Blaine. Blaine. Oh, okay. Uh, during the course of um, Grant's administration, Blaine had been uh, enriching himself, <laughs> so to speak. Really? Yes. He had, he had been uh, part of a huge number of scandals uh, basically making himself fairly wealthy off of Credit Mobilier. And so he was painted with that sort of charge. But it did not sink his career fully. Now, in 1870, on, uh, in President Grant's uh, second speech, to Congress. The second State of the Union message? Second State of the Union. I don't know if it was fully a State of the Union or just a talk to Congress. In December of 1870, Grant, in his speech, will ask for Congress to put forward measures to uh, start the civil service reform. Which so, didn't happen right away. Hang on. Grant is uh, in full voice encouraging civil service reform. As he said, it was embarrassing uh, to the president, the executive branch, and to the senators and congressmen to have to be finding jobs for these people. Well, at this time, the, there were a huge quantity of jobs that had to be filled. Exactly. And the president did it, and right. supposedly... Well, well hang, hang on. There were a huge number of jobs to be filled for a, for a handful of very interesting reasons. Number one, during the Civil War, uh, the number of people who worked for the federal government, not soldiers, just people who worked for the federal government, doubled during okay. the course of the war. Somebody's number got to order two, all the rifles. Yes. And the, yes okay. Number two, everyone who was a Southern sympathizer did not work for the federal government. So a whole bunch of people lost their jobs. Number three, there were plenty of union sympathizers who left their jobs to go fight. So that's another group of people who they had uh, left the federal workforce. Then there were those people who went and got killed. That's another group of people who never came back. After the war, there would be attempts to get rid of, quote, disloyal Democrats. Guess who that is? Tammany Hall. Well, it's also Southern sympathizers. Right. And Southern sympathizers. So in during uh, Andrew Johnson's administration, they had huge numbers of openings, especially at places like the Treasury Department. Uh, the Treasury Department was actually one of the first departments that they did do some amount of civil of civil service reform, if only because you had to have the smartest people in the Treasury Department and you had to have the least corrupt people now, in wanna, the Treasury I Department. I want to emphasize something here. We're talking about reforms in Washington, not in Tammany Hall, not in New York. Right. This is 200 miles away. But this kind of started setting the, the tone of reform right. and this process that we're going to go through and continue right. on with this next image. Um, this did lead... Well, okay. Oops, sorry. We're, you're oh, going, I, you're oh, going way too far. So far. All right. You're way too far. Back we go. Sorry. Okay. So uh, Ulysses S. Grant has been in favor of civil service okay. reform. There is a committee that's formed. It's full of a whole bunch of generals. Uh and they're going to tackle civil ser service reform. And there, I've found a really interesting article by a fellow by the name of Kellogg, who was the third head of this Committee on Civil Service Reform. So he was right in the thick of this and knew everybody involved. And he wrote this article in 1898. So it's really kind of a fascinating thing to read. But he describes 
when he was when he became the head of the Civil Service Reform Committee in um, 1872, for the past two years, nothing had been done. Congress had not put forward any sort of money towards it. Congress had not given them a meeting place to meet. Uh, they never met. They had a clerk that they were supposed to work with, and that clerk uh, was kept busy by the head of the, the chairman of the committee writing his own personal letters. Uh, and so uh, Congress completely ignored the committee. And by the time they uh, this one particular committee head, Kellogg, finishes his report and gives it to the congressional committee who is supposed to push forward a bill. This congressional committee is headed by none other than James A. Garfield. Oh, Garfield. Yes. We're going to get back to him. And, and it never comes up for a vote. Okay. It keeps getting buried and buried. So Congress, even though uh, Grant asked for it, even though they were making overtures towards real civil, civil service reform, nothing gets done. The bill is slow walked. If it, if any bill ever made because it, because that's where your power comes from. Right, you want to get a the people in you Congress want to get, wanted to give away. This is these how jobs. government is funding. We had a problem with campaign right. reform, finance reform, even then, and because, essentially this was campaign finance reform. Right, and and basically when you had President Grant saying we want to get rid of this, um, it was both parties that said, "Wait a minute, we both benefit." Uh, Grant, of course, you could say, "Well, he's trying to hurt." Tammany, he's trying to hurt the Democrats, but really it's both sides okay. that we're going to hurt. Now hold that thought, reform. because we're going to, remember, we're going to come back to civil service reform, but for just a second, we are going to talk about the next election, the next election right. cycle, which was in 1878. Samuel Tilden... 76. 76, right, there was no presidential. Thank you. Samuel Tilden was a, a leader with Tammany Hall. He right. was a powerful man who... Uh, was very influential. Right. In 1871, when Bross Tweed was arrested, hauled off, thrown in prison, did all his fun stuff that we talked about last week, Samuel Tilden formally broke with Tammany Hall. This may have been his undoing. Right. Um, Samuel Tilden ran for president. He was governor of New York. Mm -hmm. um, he was, and, and he had just broken from the machine that could have gotten him votes. Okay. He still got more votes right. than Hayes. And the Hayes-Tilden election is legendary. It's talked about a lot as probably the greatest miscarriage of justice because essentially what happened is they had a couple faithless electors. They didn't influence it, but it went to the Electoral College met. They discussed it. And ultimately, Hayes, who was the Republican, mm -hmm. agreed that if the electors would vote for him instead of for Tilden, he would end Reconstruction, remove all the troops from the South, and so on. So that's how we got the Southerners to agree to it. This was obviously incredibly upsetting to Tilden, who sure. was a reform-minded Democrat and was not pro-slavery, from what I understand. But And know, there was so a good chance that he would have brought real reform to the government. But again, it gets pushed back. There's also, there was... Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm sorry, but... So Tilden was pushed out. Hayes agrees to remove the troops so that Reconstruction ends. There's some evidence that parts of Reconstruction were working. Right. African Americans were becoming more integrated into society. They didn't get their 40 acres and a mule, but that there was progress being made. That ended in order for Hayes to assume the presidency. Tilden uh, found something called the Tilden Commission, which was supposed to eradicate corruption in New York City, but he after the election was effectively stolen from him, and that's certainly how he felt. He got very upset. He moved to Europe for a while. The Tilden Commission continued in his name without him, and they basically said, you want to end corruption in New York, we got to keep Irish people from voting. <laughs> ah! <laughs> so that's the situation now. we still got corruption in New York City. We've still got corruption in Washington of a different fashion. But we also, we also had... The people of the United States uh, and certain uh, publishers, heads of newspapers, are taking up the cry for civil service reform. Yes. That is becoming a popular movement. And a lot of our ideas about civil service reform, the corruption that's happening, and all the problems that were happening came from a particular uh, critic. Mm -hmm. Particular, We're not there yet. 
I'm okay. sorry. She was reading I ahead. I apologize. I, I read because ahead, first, but he was a supporter of Hayes. We'll get there. Yeah. I didn't know that, actually. Yep. Okay. The problem was, okay, so you've got this election. You've got Hayes is not a popular president. Right. He has his problems. Mm -hmm. And there's another election. Mm -hmm. in the election years, of 1880. Which was highly significant because this is where you had this real divide between what were called the stalwarts who said keep corruption in place because right. this is how we do business. We, you can't take patronage. the money out of, yeah. out of government. It's not going to work. Right. Keep patronage. Keep patronage. We've patronage. got to have keep patronage because that's how you ran the, the country. And then you had uh, the half-breeds, I have no idea that who they, why they were called that, who basically said, we are going to end this. The Democrats nominated General Hancock, he lost, to this guy, James Garfield. He's James the guy Garfield. on the left. Uh, Captain Kangaroo was his running mate. I'm Chester sorry. Arthur. That looks like Captain Kangaroo. Kangaroo. I mean, even the even the coat. <laughs> okay. Uh, but James James A. Garfield was what we call a dark horse. He was actually the campaign manager for another gentleman going into the Republican convention. Was that a former president himself? No, because there was a former president who also ran. Uh, there was a was, former president who ran who, who in ran. 1880 and didn't get the nomination. Yes. Grant. Yes, Ulysses Grant actually went Grant, ran, ran for, a third, for term. a third term, wanted to get it. Uh, his name was still connected with the scandals before. They mm -hmm. basically said, Ulysses, you're done. Go away. <laughs> the problem was everyone else was tainted. Everyone else in the Republican Party was tainted by uh, this credit mobilier scandal. Uh, Garfield, as I said, was a campaign manager for one of the other candidates, and he was also Speaker of the House of Representatives, I believe, at the time. Yes. Former, former um, college president, former union general. Former, yeah, he was. He had an uh, exemplary career in the Union Army. He could speak multiple languages. His idea of fun was translating Homer mm. uh, from the Greek into okay. the English. I mean, he was he was a real egghead. Well. Okay, that's a bad term. For so him. he does look like an okay. egghead. Actually, he's one of the last bald presidents we've had. But around the 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 convention couldn't decide on a candidate. Around the thirtieth ballot, thirty votes in, they find someone finally said, "How about Garfield?" And it took six more ballots, six more votes to for everyone to unanimously proclaim okay. Garfield. And Garfield. Was elected. Garfield, Garfield was elected. wanted reform. He, he was, even though he was, he was not totally clean with his hands on credit mobilier. No, he actually, wanted reform. Actually, yeah. credit mobilier. This is a great story. Uh, his his corruption through credit mobilier was accepting something like three hundred and twenty nine dollars. Um, I mean, it was a ridiculously paltry sum. Not then. It was. It was well, a out lot. Of 40 million dollars out of forty million dollars, it was it was completely ridiculous. But the Democrats knew the exact amount, three hundred and twenty nine dollars or something like that. It was a, it was a um, amount like that. And so everywhere Grant went, uh, and everywhere there was a pro Grant speech, they would chalk three twenty nine on the sidewalks and the walls, so that everyone remembered that Grant uh, that Garfield. Garfield took money from Credit Mobilier. Okay. So you have this movement now. So Garfield is elected. He wants reform. Chester Arthur, his vice president, says, who was part of a Republican machine. He was a, right. a friend of Roscoe Conkling, who was uh, totally ran the Republican Party, which right. was at this time was as corrupt as Tammany Hall, except that it was corporate interests rather than individual right. interests. And Garfield, of course, was uh, from Ohio, but... Um, but Chester A. Chester Arthur, Arthur was from New York. Was from New York. Well, you had at this time New York was far and away the most populous state. Yeah. It's now number four. Right. And you you rarely had a political ticket that didn't have somebody from New York on sure. it. But something happened that changed the entire picture of the political situation, the call for reform. Mm -hmm. And it was at a train station. James A. Garfield was getting on a train to go on vacation when Gitao, what was Gitao's first name? I don't remember. Uh, oh, um, oh, gee, um, Louis Gitao. I don't think so. Anyway, anyway, anyway so uh, this gentleman named Gitao, I've got to look it up, uh, sh shoots him. It took shoots Garfield him. about five months to die. Yeah, uh, Gitao uh, um, had been a stalwart, 
he in fact will proclaim himself a stalwart of the stalwarts. When he was arrested, when he was arrested, he said the famous line, "I am the stalwart of stalwarts," because he wanted a federal job. He was desperate to get a federal job. He had worked for Garfield's campaign. He felt entitled to. He now, felt technically, entitled. For he the had record, written letters. Technically, that's okay. Yeah. Gitau wrote a speech, which he considered this brilliant, eloquent thing. People have read it said, he was, he was a little wacko. He wrote a speech for the campaign of Ulysses Grant for president in 1880. Right. When Grant dropped out, he basically went in and changed the name <laughs> to, name to Garfield. Garfield. He gave the speech and passed right. it around. I think he had it published. He mm -hmm. didn't just pay somebody off. And after Garfield was elected, he said, well, Garfield was elected because of my speech. Right. Therefore, Garfield owes me a job. And Guito had been to the White House several times uh, and waited in the in the hallway and actually talked to Garfield. Yes. At least, they know at least once. He decided, originally he wanted to be ambassador to Austria. He later said, decided he was settled for Paris. Yeah. And he contacted <laughs> the Secretary of State, right. James Blaine. Oh. And, and basically they had this, eventually James Blaine said, just shut up about Paris. You're not going anywhere. Just go away. Yeah. So he wanted spoils. He felt he was entitled. Right. Nobody else felt he was entitled. James Blaine was also accompanying Garfield on the day that Gitau shot him in the train station. Right. So Gitau kills him. Chester Arthur becomes president. Chester Arthur, who has traditionally been a defender of the spoil system, is now dealing with the fact that Garfield has become something of a martyr. Garfield took so long to die, and the newspapers carried the reports of his health every day. And so he became front page uh, for his suffering. Supposedly, he maybe would have survived the wound. Uh, Gita always they, said that. Yeah. Gita said, I didn't kill him. Doctors it was the doctors him. who killed him. Because the germ theory was not very popular and the doctors were convinced they really needed to get that bullet out. And so they were getting their fingers and instruments and all sorts of nasty stuff into Garfield. Uh, meanwhile, Garfield is suffering horribly, no anesthesia. Um, except for alcohol. And, yeah, except for alcohol. And you had a, a, another... Wonderful thing happened to him. Um, I believe it was Edison had decided he was going to, he created a bed that was going to do something or other that to get the bullet out. Magnetically. Yeah, magnetic. it was a magnetic sort of thing. Um, that, uh, is it's that been, the one that had the magnetic sensor, but the magnetic sensor kept picking up the bed, so they were digging the wrong spot? Yeah, is that and, the case? Yeah, it, okay. yeah, that's one of the things. But supposedly he had created this bed and it sent electric currents. And uh, it turned out to be a really good laxative for some whatever reason. <laughs> anyway. All right. So, so Garfield finally dies. Now, here's a picture of Gitau on the far left hand of your screen from Puck Magazine that says, an office or a life. Because Gitau felt entitled to an office. Right. And he basically shot the president because he didn't get it. So everybody basically says, okay, I think this spoil system has gone on long enough. Right. And... Uh, Essentially, Arthur did sort of switch sides and pushed through the Civil Service Reform Act, right. also known as the Pendleton Civil the Service Act. Pendleton Sur Civil Service Act of 1883. And really, it was this idea of, well, Garfield wanted it this way. It was so it Garfield was what it wanted. Yeah, it okay. was a, it was a sympathetic move towards Garfield because I don't know if the other thing is you had, seen an you had seen an example of what happens when people are seeking offices. Right. You know, oh, yeah. You've seen this carried to the extreme. This is, um, by the way, there was another image on that uh, slide back there, which is, um, this is a Thomas Nast cartoon in the middle, the victor, the spoils. That's uh, Andrew Jackson, who pretty much really championed the spoils system because Andrew Jackson was elected by small timers. Oh, yeah. So riding on Andrew the hog, passing out the favors. And basically, this is Thomas Nast, the cartoonist, saying, okay, we're done with spoils. It's all over. The end. Yeah, Jackson. Jackson gets the blame for creating basically the spoil system. Okay. Um, so after that, Chester Arthur, um, one-term president, um, mm -hmm. 
did sign the Chinese Exclusion Act, which basically means eh, you're not a good guy anymore. Yeah, no more, yeah, <laughs> no more, no more immigration of Chinese to America. So, yeah. okay. but so the Republican Party now becomes the party of reform. Right. It had already had the anti-alcohol people in it who were very much, you know, campaigning mm -hmm. against alcohol, mm -hmm. campaigning against. Uh, they, they they were for African American rights, just not right. Irish rights. Right. But so now, after this point, the Republicans were the party of reform. Yes, the they could they could corruption. hang their hats on that. They one. now had the high horse. And yeah. so the the camp the uh, convention of 1884. 1884. Yes. Well, I don't know this one. Oh yeah, uh, nothing. It didn't really um, have an exciting convention. But the two candidates who uh, the who come out of the various conventions is of course James G. Blaine and Scott. No, who beat Blaine? Cleveland. Cleveland, yes. Ah, uh, because Cleveland rocks. Grover Cleveland. Um, Blaine. Uh, hey, Blaine was considered the front runner. It looked like he was going to win. It was very very close though. However. One week, one week before the election, Blaine, uh, well, let me go back a little bit, rewind a little bit. The whole election, the Republicans were hoping to go in on this idea of, of reform, on uh, uh, ending, uh, ending the um, racism, that sort of thing, a party of equal rights. And Remember, so reconstruction was already over. The federal right. troops are out of the South and efforts at reform were gone. The Klan is already dominating. They had killed thousands of people who tried to vote when they were the wrong color. Right. So racial reform was in not in good shape at this point. Right. But the problem was Grover Cleveland's platform was barely different than Blaine's. Blaine's platform was just a little bit one way and Cleveland's platform was a little bit the other way. So the horse race wasn't all that exciting. <laughs> what became exciting was the fact that someone found out that Grover Cleveland had had an illegitimate child. Boy, this is way off topic. <laughs> for which, hang on, for which he had apologized and supported. But of course there were cartoons, editorial cartoons going the whole time of, uh, of, uh, uh, jokes about ma, ma, where's my pa gone to the White House, ha, ha, ha. Um, and Blaine is accused of having an illegitimate child. Uh, that was a kind of a false accusation. So this, this political fight, instead of talking about the issues, everyone was talking about these illegitimate children or supposedly illegitimate children. And it was this big fight over who was more proper. Cleveland or Blaine. Now, one week before the election, Blaine is downstairs in a hotel lobby with his family, and he is meeting with a bunch of pastors, Protestant pastors. He's trying to polish up his image mm -hmm. um, by trying to look more moral than Cleveland. And one of the pastors gives an invocation during this meeting in which he pronounces uh, all of the all of the Protestants should be, be should be for Blaine and oh by the way the Democrats are the party of rum, Romanism, and um, rum, Romanism, and rebellion. Rebellion meaning. Of course, the Civil War. You make it sound like politics was as ugly in the 1880s. It was as it is today. really ugly, and the idea of Blaine saying, you know, not telling this pastor you shouldn't say that he didn't. Uh, various historians think he didn't hear it, mm -hmm. or maybe wasn't paying attention. Uh, but he did not deny it until a couple of days later but it was too late. He lost the New York vote. He might've had enough of the New York vote, but he lost all of the uh, various Catholic sympathizers, which was kind of ironic in Blaine's part because most of Blaine's family was Catholic. 
This is all stuff I didn't know. But let's go back yeah. to New York. Okay. Anyway, so, oh, anyway, so, um, the, the uh, Republicans had, had bolted from Blaine. They saw him as being too corrupt. So there was a handful of Republicans who bolted from him. They were called mugwumps. Uh, and one of the most prominent mugwumps was a guy who supported Grant, a guy, uh, Hayes, a guy who supported Garfield, uh, and then went over to Grover Cleveland and was very proud of the fact that he was a mugwump. And it's his writing that's going to form most of our ideas of this uh, period after Reconstruction and during the Gilded Age. And that's Mark Twain. Okay, I that that's totally contradicted by what I've read. Really? Okay. Totally. The, yes. Mark, Twain, Mark Twain was not involved in politics no, until he the 1890s. Was, he was okay. involved with Mark politics. Mark Twain mocked mugwumps. Mark Twain was not a mugwump. Okay, Mark he Twain was, was a, not a member of politics. Okay, he was ladies and gentlemen, we have a disagreement. Yeah. yeah. Okay. This does not fit with what I have read. I will need to... Okay. Can you excuse me while I go... Okay, we're going to have to look at it. Okay. okay. Um, anyway, let's go back to New York. Because we were talking... We were here to talk about Tammany Hall and corruption. And... It was really going good at this time. Mm -hmm. um, on your far right, you have an image from Puck. Puck was kind of the funny cartoons of the time. That is John Kelly galvanizing or resurrecting Tammany, the Native American for whom Tammany Hall is named after. Um, <laughs> this is, of course, a Frankenstein-type reference. Um, John Kelly was the Irish Catholic who took over after Boss Tweed went to prison. He was called Honest John. He, we haven't found really good, solid evidence of him being really, really corrupt, but we know that he went into the office a rich mm -hmm. man and he came out an obscenely rich man. Yes. And so there was definitely some, some, some stuff going on at the time. Um, this movement is going bad. The, one of the biggest complaints throughout the, the New York, honestly, to this day, but especially mm -hmm. this time, was the police department. Because we have ended political appointments for government, federal government positions, mm -hmm. but not New York. Not New York, not city positions, certainly not. And so you have police in particular. There was an old saying that it was called the Irish sweepstakes, whoever gets into the uh, police department and gets a promotion. Right. Um, so the, the New York police department is widely accused of being on the take. And um, there's an image here. Oop, oop. Um, in the center, you can see that's a... New York police commissioner uh, out trying to bust various things. The gentleman on the far right is a fun fellow by the name of William DeVry. DeVry, I'm not entirely sure how you pronounce his name. He was a common police officer who walked the street, did his business, um, basically became a captain, moved up through the ranks, eventually became, well, as a captain, he's famous for going into an office and talking to his men, and he said, they tell me there's a lot of grafting going on in this precinct. They tell me that you fellows are the fiercest ever on graft. Now that's going to stop. If there's any grafting to be done, I'll do it. He was terribly open about his corruption. Mm -hmm. He was arrested. He went to prison. He got out. He was renamed as police commissioner. Sure. <laughs> the Lexo Commission, which was a big investigative body, which we're going to talk about in a second, ultimately had the law changed in such a way that it prevented him from being uh, reappointed. So he basically took his fabulous wealth that he made as the chief of police, mm -hmm. and he bought the Baltimore Orioles. <laughs> the baseball team. <laughs> and he moved them to New York. Yes. And he changed their name. To? Well, he called them at first the New York Highlanders. Uh -huh. And then they changed it later to the New York Yankees. Uh -huh. So if you are a New York Yankees fan, you can thank police corruption. <laughs> <laughs> and Tammany Hall. Okay. The Lexo Commission was the big political group named by State Senator Lexo, who organized it. They gathered together 10,000 volumes of information into a report. It was just very, very... Do I have an image for that? I thought I did. Um, maybe I don't. Okay. Uh, it was considered the end of the end of the corruption, but there was a, uh, 
a classic story of Captain Timothy Creedon described how he paid $15,000 in the 1890s to obtain a captain's rank. Right. $15,000. You know, that mm -hmm. might have buy you a house in Manhattan back then. Right. Okay. He said that he did not achieve his rank prior to payment, even though the examination of the score was 97.82. He was quoted a price of $12,000, but the Tammany district leader, John W. Reppenhagen, notice it's not an Irish name, um, told Creedon that another officer had come up with that amount, and the new price was $15,000, which Creedon paid. Creedon also revealed that a portion of that cost was paid by local businesses. So we have businesses sponsoring police officers for promotion. Mm -hmm. You know, $15,000 is a lot for somebody to come up with. Mm -hmm. And you were expected to make it back. So they're sponsoring this guy to basically look the other way when you see stuff going on in my business, this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. This was really out of control corruption. We had in around 1900, the election of Seth Lowe, who was a major, major reformer. He mm -hmm. pushed things, and that's why you got that cartoon that I was showing a second ago, which everybody realized that Tammany Hall was now dead and mm -hmm. gone. The end of Tammany Hall. Um, doesn't always work that way. Nope. One of the things that we see consistently is Tammany comes into power, then the reformers push them out, and the reformers are pushing the end of alcohol, mm -hmm. end of everything else, end of corruption, mm -hmm. more government control. One of the aspects of the Civil Service, Pendleton Civil Service Act, was it ended a lot of private contributions, and the critics said this gave corporations much more power over the choice of candidates. Of candidates, yeah. So we see a growth of corporate investment. Uh, we also see the Republican Party doing some very interesting things to whittle away the power of places like Tammany Hall. One of them was temperance. Temperance, which of course goes back to the issue of Tammany. First off, guys usually work mm -hmm. six days a week, mm -hmm. you know, and, and uh, Sunday was their only day. Uh, the temperance movement started by banning alcohol on right. Sundays so that they couldn't meet. Tammany Hall usually met in bars. That was what mm -hmm. they did. There is a saloon in New York City. I've got a picture of it here, which was this, the main hangout. It's still open today. It's quite uh, quite hip to go visit. You got it? We should have done it. Well, you've talked for a second. I'll fight it here. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, I did find the quote from John from Mark Twain. Well, I'm not to Mark Twain it. yet, okay. so just hang on. All right. Um, where's, your, where's your idea? Man? Where's your idea? This is uh, McSorley's Bar, established in 1854. In 1970, they started allowing women in, but um, it is uh, it's a cool painting. of Basically, this is how Tammany business was done. You meet at the bar, you have a couple drinks, you say, I need you to vote for my guy, I need you to do stuff. We're going we're gonna to make this work. Right. And the... Prohibitionists were trying to shut down the bars. Trying, Eventually, of course, they did with all with prohibition. With the Volstead Act uh, and the 18th Amendment in 1920. But the other big thing that happened with the reform movement was something called consolidation. Mm -hmm. New York City, of course, is made up of five boroughs. Five, well, it wasn't until the 1890s. Right. It's was five separate cities. Five separate, technically counties. Right. Brooklyn had incorporated things. So one of the reform efforts was we are going to bring all of these groups in. And Tammany only really has power in Manhattan. So suddenly they're going to go from Tammany controlling much the state government through a city, because they control the city mm -hmm. of a million and a half people, to a city of three and a half million people. Mm -hmm. You bring in all these people. Tammany was greatly weakened. Yeah. Briefly. Briefly. <laughs> briefly. Another one of the more interesting uh, ways that conservatives and Republicans tried to whittle away the power of Tammany Hall was through Central Park. You wouldn't think that a park would have been a political firestorm, and yet it was. Frederick Law Olmsted, who was won the design competition, was a conservative Republican who wanted to see the park as this area where people could go and gently walk around or ride their carriages around. He wanted to see carriage trails. He wanted to see bridle trails. Um, and he didn't want to hear what uh, many people wanted to have in Central Park. Uh, because only 5% of the people in New York could afford carriages. Not that many people still aren't a lot owned, of people with carriages yeah, after fashion. owned horses. The rules for the park 
banned using commercial vehicles in the park. So even if you had a you know delivery truck, you couldn't go there, a delivery wagon, you couldn't go there and use it. And they banned any concessionaries. And they banned picnics on Sunday and concerts on Sunday. You should be in church. Right. You should be in church. Or they had concerts. Clubs. Yeah. They had concerts on Saturday. You could have picnics on Saturday, but not on Sunday, the one day that the working people had um, to go to the park. Also, the idea of working people who could not afford carriages, who could sometimes not afford even the, the horse-drawn trams or anything like that to get to work, who had to walk everywhere they went, the idea of going to the park to walk was silly. <laughs> they also really, really, really wanted a racetrack. There was enough room in the park to put a horse racing track uh, in that in one of the areas, and Frederick Law Olmsted fought them against it. He didn't want gambling and a race track in the middle of his beautiful uh, naturalistic park. Um, one of my uh, one of my professors, Roy Rosenzweig, who's uh, passed away a couple of years ago, wrote a great book on Central Park and all of the political battles about it. And he talked, he writes, ex wrote extensively about all of these battles that the Irish wanted racetracks in the park. And well, so that was also a cultural it. thing. It was also gambling, but it's also Just, a cultural thing. Yeah, it was also okay. a culture. Now, when Olmsted is doing this, he has something of a friend in Tammany Hall by the name right. of George Washington Plunkett. Yes. Now, Plunkett, um, was not a full sachem. He was a ways down the list, but this is a picture of him in his office. He <laughs> held court basically at a shoe shine stand and he would be there every day and people would come to see him. Plunkett was, um, again, he wasn't a super important character in the history of Tammany Hall, but he's a fun one to talk about because there is a book out there called Plunkett of Tammany Hall. It's available free. If so, if you go to iTunes or I iBooks or uh, Google Play or even uh, Internet Archive, you can download it free. It's just a fun read because he talks about his famous line is, I seen opportunities and I took them. Yep. He basically was city planning commissioner. And when he found out that they were going to build parks or right. other things, build, build Central Park, they had to the buy land. it. Yeah, the, it was a swamp. Or he bought but the it land had, adjacent to it. Yeah, it, it was a swamp that had been occupied by a bunch of Irish workers yeah. and, and a very large uh, African-American uh, community. And uh, that was all bought up for people who were going, who knew the park was coming. Plunkett referred to this as honest graft. Yeah. He said, there's honest graft and dishonest graft. Dishonest graft is when you beat somebody up and take their money. Honest graft is when you see opportunities and, and you take, take them. them. Um, Plunkett was also, again, his book is a fun read because, and it's short, so I do recommend it. We'll put something in the description. But um, his scree against civil service, and he's, yeah. he says, why should you have to take a test and be able to know how tall the Statue of Liberty is in order to work as an inspector? You know, mm -hmm. which, you know, you find a few ex egregious examples. He felt that graft, appointment, Political patronage, the spoil systems, mm -hmm. was American, was essential, that it was patriotic. Right. Because it's how you get people involved in politics. Mm -hmm. And while I think that's nonsense, it's still an interesting perspective. That got people involved in politics. Knowing you could get a job makes people vote. Today, a lot of people don't bother to vote. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I wanted to talk a little more about, you know, at this time we have another reform movement going. And this is, again, um, this is where Misha jumped ahead of me. Because Sorry. <laughs> we don't rehearse this, folks, or can you tell? It's um, live. Um, okay. Um, another cartoon from Puck, which I really love, which is, um, it can't quite read the caption, but it's basically um, a saloon keeper's putting up a sign that says, you know, closed by order of the law. And the Tammany executive is saying, look, if you want to make some money, vote for me and we'll repeal the law. Um, the center is, of course, the volume three of the 10,000 pages of the Lexo report. But Mark Twain, and again, this is my information. We've read different books. We have sure. different things. That's part of history is sometimes, sometimes in history, you get contradictory information, you get distinction. My understanding was that he did not become in 
involved in politics until 1900 with the election of Seth Lowe, who was a major Republican reformer who made a lot of progress. And he gave a couple of speeches. He mm -hmm. called it the Acorn Party because Twain didn't like being involved in political parties. Right. So they were from this something mighty. Well, see, let grow. me let me let me explain. It's what I'm what I was saying about his being a mugwump is not so different from what you're saying. In his book speeches, Mark Twain says uh, uh, he knows that in the whole history of the race of men, no single great and high and beneficent thing was ever done for the souls and bodies, the hearts and the brains of the children of this world, but a mugwump started it, and mugwumps carried it to victory, and their names are the stateliest in history, Washington, Garrison, Galileo, Luther, Christ. Loyalty to petrified opinions never yet broke a chain or freed a human soul in this world and never will. Okay. Well, we'll be arguing this off camera a little later. Yeah. Now, Garrison, she mentioned, is one of my heroes, William Lloyd Garrison, who championed nonviolent resistance to slavery. We're going to do a show about them. Yeah, and abolition. Yeah, abolition. Yeah, yeah, okay. Major abolitionist. Mark Twain gave a couple speeches, and one of them he famously said, Tammany is dead. There's no use in blackguarding a corpse. <laughs> he campaigned against Richard Croker. Richard Croker was the shaman no, Sachem. Sachem of Tammany Hall uh, in the early 20th century. He was really, really corrupt. But he basically said, you know, I impeach Richard Croker of high crimes and misdemeanors. I impeach him in the name of the people whose trust he betrayed. I impeach him in the name of the people of America who has dishonored him. I impeach him in the name of virtue of those eternal laws of justice he has violated. This was actually a paraphrase of a speech by Edmund Burke. Mm, okay. But, um, this was Mark Twain really got involved in politics at this time, campaigned for it because he believed, even though he lived in Connecticut, mm -hmm. that this was a chance to end the corruption in Tammany Hall. Mm -hmm. And it probably did until Prohibition came along. <laughs> <laughs> and then Prohibition, of course, is going to break, pardon me, is going to bring people out of the woodwork because alcohol. People want to drink. People wanted to drink. You also had, you know, the growth of corruption. One of the issues that and is, oh, and the temperance movement was a rural movement. Yes, and we also have um, the growth of different types of corruption, which is basically right. black uh, black market alcohol, right? Uh, rum runners and so on. Tammany, you know, was not directly involved, but there were certainly Irish Americans who were involved. Yep, and also Italian Americans. The yep. Italian American experience is strangely different from the Irish American experience. Because the Italian American experience had bolstered themselves through their own production of wine. Okay. Under the Volstead Act, you could grow your own grapes and make your own wine for your own public consumption. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But it was just importing and selling and buying and, and drinking stuff that other people had made okay. was what didn't. What but was illegal? Also, Tammany had opposed, Tammany was, of course, Catholic aligned. The Catholic Church had opposed women's suffrage. Tammany opposed the women's suffrage until uh, 1916. Yep. Now, New York only adopted women's suffrage three years before the rest of the country, mm -hmm. um, by which time there were like 12 states that had California, right. Wyoming, of course, mm -hmm. uh, Utah. All of these states had women's suffrage long before right. New York and the rest of the country. But so you have the reform movement rising and falling again. Everybody thought it was wiped out. Uh, prohibition comes in, and somehow there's something that people can rally around. And one yep. of the things that Tammany leaders, including this gentleman, really campaigned for was the end of prohibition. So now you got a cause you can get the people united behind. Right. We're going to end prohibition. And a pretty popular cause, too. Now, this is Al Smith. The Happy Warrior. That was the name given to him by Franklin Roosevelt. He was, as we can see here, a Tammany Ward healer, but nobody to this day has found evidence of his personally being corrupt, of him being on the take of anything like that. And that's significant mm -hmm. because this means to me that Tammany Hall was not by definition corrupt. Right. Because he was involved in everything. He went to the meetings, he gathered people, he called them up, said, are you going to vote? Mm -hmm. he, he went around, he probably helped with problems, but there's no evidence anywhere of any money changing hands, of anything right. really bad happening. Now, he might have hidden it really well, but he had enough political enemies, they would have tried to find sure. it. Sure, yeah, they would have found it, I think. Al Smith, of course, ran for president in 1928. Mm -hmm. um, 
he was, because he was Catholic, he was ruthlessly attacked, and everybody said, you're going to basically turn the control of America over to, to Rome. Yeah. I don't know if this made a difference because the economy was booming. Herbert Hoover, who ran against him, was seen as the hero of the Commerce Department and who would end famines in... Right. In Belgium after Russia. World War One and Russia, so uh, during the Russian, I don't know that famine. anybody could have beaten Herbert Hoover at that moment. Yeah, uh, Herbert Hoover was was someone who was riding quite high uh, in the fields of things like technocracy. Yeah, and business. He, and he business. was a businessman. He believed in the role of business. He, he he concluded that if you didn't have your first million by the time you were thirty years old, you were a useless slob. I'm going to use the slob. <laughs> <laughs> you already knew that. <laughs> All right. Um, so, again, we've got Al Smith, who represents this strange... Um, you know, the, the more modern Tammany Hall. How about that? The more modern Tammany Hall, but... He's fighting for the workers. The, the Leading the investigation against the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory, um, I've had to read the fire reports of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. Uh, there, there are documents, very few documents on earth that are that are more horrifying than that. Well, 117 that. very young women died because yeah. they were didn't have the most basic of workplace yeah. safety. There were conditions. fire there were firemen who were crushed to death because women whose hair and clothes were on fire were leaping out of the ninth ninth story window and falling on firemen and crushing them to death. So this is um, it was really remarkably horrific in the middle of Manhattan, and it got everybody's attention. There's very good American experience. Okay. Um, but the result of this was Tammany Hall, led in part by Al Smith, who wasn't the station, but he was still up there, mm -hmm. championed the idea of requiring workplace safety conditions, requiring right. fire inspections, right. requiring a certain amount of time off for workers, which came out of this process, requiring mm -hmm. insurance for work, you know, all these things which we kind of take for granted now. And I know some people think business will do that anyway, but they won't. Mm -hmm. And you need basic protection. So Al Smith seems to have been... A real working man's champion. The exception. Yeah. Ran for president, lost. Because he was Catholic. I mean, truly... And because he ran against Bert Hoover during yeah. booming economic times. Yes. Okay, so... We come out of that. We go into the 30s. Bert Hoover becomes very unpopular. The governor the of New York. Crash, the, the, the crash of October of yeah. Governor of New York was Franklin Roosevelt, who becomes yep. President Franklin Roosevelt. Right. Franklin Roosevelt had been... A Democrat. Yes, but he had, was not a Tammany Democrat. Nope. He had been dissed by Tammany a few times. He had been dissed by Tammany, and he spent most of his time in upstate New York. So he was, he was a man of Albany not a man of Manhattan. And, and he, that made a difference. Here he is. Um, this is Franklin Roosevelt meeting with Fiero LaGuardia. Now, LaGuardia became mayor of New York. You notice the Italian-American name, but LaGuardia was technically, he was, he was raised Episcopalian, lived, right. grew up in Arizona. His mother was Jewish. Yep. He spoke five languages. <laughs> he actually was accused of anti-Semitism once, and so he campaigned for a couple of days in Yiddish. <laughs> LaGuardia has his problems. He was a tyrant. He did not tolerate dissent and so on. But he also was a man of the people. He knew how to do things. And he was a friend of Franklin Roosevelt. Even though Roosevelt was a Democrat and LaGuardia was a Republican, he supported the New Deal. He supported an end to prohibition. He supported a number of Democratic causes. And with Franklin Roosevelt, they went through and they did a number of things because in addition to the mafia. Mm -hmm. and, oh, by the way, uh, LaGuardia managed to get the Italian-American vote, which had almost always gone Democrat. Right. So Tammany is suddenly weakened now in the 30s during the Depression. LaGuardia is championing a number of reforms. Mm -hmm. And, um, well, I have an account here somewhere of where he was, uh, he supported the FDR and cut the patronage from people who had opposed. FDR backed up LaGuardia by cutting patronage from certain people. Um, who had opposed him. LaGuardia reorganized the police department. Um, he was tolerant of... I'm going to keep going. Okay. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna run a little long today. I'm sorry. We have a lot to cover. So LaGuardia uh, reformed the police department, welcomed immigrants. He was a different sort of mayor. Mm -hmm. And working with Franklin Roosevelt, they made real inroads and led to 
what I had thought was the final end of Tammany Hall. Yep. But it wasn't. Nope. Oh, no. The tiger's back. The tiger returns. The tiger came back in the 1950s with a man by the name of Carmen Di Sapio, Italian-American. Grand stage from there you can see from 1949 to 1964. He got his face and the Tammany Tiger on the cover of Time magazine in the 1950s. Wow. Something that really surprised me because much of what I had read said Tammany was done by LaGuardia, but it was mm -hmm. back, it was in full force. He did a lot of things. He had tremendous sway in politics. As it says here, he called himself a reformer. He went and took the price that you had to pay Tammany Hall to be nominated for a judgeship. And if you were nominated for a judge, you were elected to basically to get you on the ballot. Right. He lowered it from $75,000 to only $25,000. What a guy! <laughs> Uh, yeah. De Sapio was always accused, probably because he was Italian-American, of being friends with Frank Costello, mm -hmm. the uh, head of the uh, Luciano crime family. Mm -hmm. um, there's still people who say that. There's historians who disagree on this. We know, you know, he says, well, I met him several times, but, you know, prominent sure. Italian-Americans, that sort of at, thing. At baptisms and weddings, that sort of thing. Yeah, whatever. Um but as I said, we have not seen a lot of evidence of Tammany Hall killing people. Mm -mm. They were corrupt. They were on the take. They took bribes, but they didn't seem to kill people very much. But De Sapio basically brought back the power of Tammany Hall in the 1950s. And one of the things that he did was he appointed powerful people. That's uh, De Sapio on the far left in the center. Sorry, on the far. I'm sorry. It's backwards on my screen. On the left, you see Robert F. Wagner, who he appointed as mayor of New York. Now, he didn't appoint him, but he basically said, this is the guy. We're going to do it. We're going to get him on the system. The guy in the center was Averill Harriman, who he basically had put into the position of governor. And DeSabio had this power. He basically pulled the strings, got the stuff done, managed to pick, just like people 100 years before, mm -hmm. managed to get his people into positions of power. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, he also led to integration. He appointed blacks and Puerto Ricans as ward bosses and healers. He brought them into the New York government when he controlled Robert Wagner, not the actor. Um, he had this tremendous, a lot of progress, he called himself a reformer, but again, he lowered the price right. of his bribes. He didn't eliminate them. The problem was DeSapio offended the wrong person. Oops. Yes. Um, we're going to look back at that picture again. Because, um, oops, sure we are. Um, again, the guy in the middle is Avril Harriman, son of E.H. Harriman, the owner of Union Pacific Railroad. I work for E.H. Harriman. Oh, sorry, old movie. Um, and he wanted to be governor. The problem was he challenged a gentleman by the name of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Jr., Franklin Delano Roosevelt Jr. was a favorite. He was rising in the in the party, and this is you know this is after. Sorry, this is after uh, Franklin Roosevelt is dead. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, Franklin Jr.'s mother, has been a muckety muck with the Democratic Party with uh, mm -hmm. the United Nations, mm -hmm. and she basically says, uh, "This ain't gonna happen. You just my son." As I said in the slide there, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Eleanor Roosevelt basically went on the warpath against DeSapio, and she organized a group called the Committee of Democratic Voters, the CDV, and they organized campaigns, they sponsored candidates, they got things together, they brought everything together, and they ultimately got um, Mayor Wagner to denounce Tammany Hall. So basically... Eleanor Roosevelt has taken over the role of Tammany Hall. In other words, she created an alternative that Democrats could look to rather than Tammany Hall. Yes. And, you know, when Wagner changed, Tammany Hall was now just, and Eleanor Roosevelt was kind of a saint in the society. So uh, when you've, you, you've angered her, she famously said of Carmen DeSapio, I told Carmen I would get him for what he did to Franklin Jr. And get him, I did. Uh, so there's no question that Eleanor Roosevelt helped bring down DeSapio. DeSapio was the last powerful leader of Tammany Hall. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt met with Kennedy and pushed through various reforms. Kennedy was, of course, another 
Irish Catholic, right. who was not involved in New York politics, was not involved in Tammany Hall in any way, shape, or form. Although he still faced some anti-Catholic uh, lots. His uh, brother, problems. the attorney general, uh, was huge on cracking down on all sorts of corruption. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, it pretty much ended with DiSapio forced from power. He went to jail. He was arrested in 1969, was convicted, spent two years in prison, and basically died a few years ago. You can read mm -hmm. his obituary. It's, it's kind of fascinating. Um, but DiSapio was the last powerful boss, the last boss with any influence of Tammany Hall. What I find interesting is the guy who unseated him, in part with Eleanor Roosevelt's help, was a gentleman by the name of Raymond Jones. That's him on the far left of your screen. Raymond Jones was an African-American. So you now had Tammany Hall, which in the 1860s had supported a keep this a white man's country, is now being run by a black man. Yeah. Um, part of me thinks that it would have been a neat transition if you had had, you know, mm -hmm. the next group of rising people who are ostracized from society come in here. But at the same time, Tammany Hall was corrupt. It had to end. I think so. Yeah. So the question is, was Tammany Hall a necessary evil? Was it good or bad for society? You know. Did it do more good than harm because it was the only voice that so many people had for so many years? Or by being corrupt, did it force their opponents to do good things? Okay. Um, that's a little dangerous. But, yeah. Because that's kind of like saying, um, because I'm shooting at you, you locked your doors at night. You know, yeah. whatever. Because I'm lighting matches outside, you get a fire extinguisher. You know, it's like, that's not really fair. My position is that Tammany Hall was, of course, corrupt, and that's not acceptable. Buying mm -hmm. votes, we can't ever say, no matter how just you are, no matter how ostracized, how ostracized you are from society, mm -hmm. you know, we have to say, no, this isn't acceptable. But the problem is, you had the Irish and the Jewish people, who were later became part of Tammany mm -hmm. Hall, German immigrants, probably some of my ancestors, uh, were, became part of this organ, they were suppressed. They were kept out of the political system by very powerful people. Mm -hmm. People who are suppressed don't stay suppressed. Mm -hmm. Human spirit is indomitable. Mm -hmm. People will find a way to get power to get their needs met, mm -hmm. okay? They formed an organization. They formed a shadow government. That shadow government met their basic needs. But uh, what would be a more healthy approach would be the creation of a public sphere. Uh, welcoming them the into the I, public sphere so that they don't... Yes. Because in their shadow government, in their separate government... They, there are no checks and balances. And this is what happens in a true public sphere when it's working correctly, is that you've got multiple inputs of information. You've got ways to check this information. You've got more voices. You've got people speaking up. And you've got the feedback loop that allows... Uh, the leaders not only to hear, but also to be able to understand what's going on and work towards a solution. Comment in our live chat: the one ring can't be used for good. Yeah. <laughs> well, the problem is we have this today, and I'm, I'm going to get political now. We have various oh, like you haven't been. <laughs> we have groups that are pushed out of society that yeah. we're trying to ship them out of the country to, right. to re deny citizenship, deny basic rights to. Okay, these people are not going to go, oh, you're suppressing me. I guess I will just sit here and feel sorry for myself for the rest of my life. Well, we've got this, this uh, charge being hurdled at our modern politics, identity politics. Um, funny how, them. yeah, funny how the only people hurdling the charge of identity politics are the people in the majority. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, when we did the Japanese American project, Years ago, we made Years a documentary ago. on the Japanese American internment camps. Together. And and we interviewed a Japanese American uh, who said, when, when you're in the majority, you never think of the minority. But when you're in the minority, you never think of anything else. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is kind of stuck with me all this time. But if you don't want corruption, if you right. don't want people on the tick, if you don't want runaway crime, not petty crime, petty crime is a different issue. Yeah. But if you don't want organized crime problems, mm -hmm. then you need to bring everybody into society. Right. And you, you cannot and have second class citizens. 
but you have to have the feedback loop. You have to have checks and balances, and you have and to have transparency. And our government has checks. It took forever because, yeah. for example, you know, look how long it took the spoil system to get tamed. Mm -hmm. There's still corruption, but mm -hmm. it's a lot better. If you've ever applied for federal jobs, you know it's hard. They're checking you out, yeah. and usually you've got a pretty you, you're being treated mm -hmm. some fairly. Yeah. Sometimes their favorite son gets in, but it's pretty hard Very to rare. pay somebody off to get a federal job. Or but, a federal contract, even. But we have we now have structures like the uh, political action committees, where they, you know, they don't have to report their donors. We are lacking transparency, and we are lacking a, uh, the ability to check on them and to see who's actually doing this and why. Okay, we've touched on a lot of topics on sure. this show that we might want to revisit in future episodes, like mm -hmm. campaign finance reform, yeah. like the Gilded Age, the corruption of the Gilded Age within society, mm -hmm. like. Theodore Roosevelt, and the press, we sort of hinted at, but the yeah. role of the press and all this stuff, these are all things we can talk about in future episodes because as it is, we've taken two hours and we've yep. run over time this time uh -oh. because there's just so much to say. And the non sequitur show is going to be mad at us. Because we normally try to be their lead in. Yeah, we normally try to get done by the time they start, but they're doing an Ask Me Anything uh So ask them event. why they don't all watch History Unsettled. History Unsettled, yeah. <laughs> Thank anyway. you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for being here, everybody. And don't forget to subscribe, leave comments, and see your dentist twice a year. It can really help prevent long-term tooth damage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Bye.